We are the church and we are unstoppable. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. Amen. So when you understand that, you recognize you are unstoppable. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Amen. So God is our refuge. He is our strength. And this is why we don't have to be afraid. Praise the Lord. What we're doing, uh, we're, uh, this is part two of a message um, I started a few weeks ago called Unstoppable. And I just want to read a, a few verses here in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. And uh, Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I the son of man am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah and others Jeremiah are one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus said uh, that uh, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. So um, I think it's important to understand that Jesus wasn't building uh, the church uh, on Peter per se. It was built on the revelation that Peter had and that is that Jesus Christ is the Savior, that he is the Messiah, that he is Lord. That is the rock upon which the church is built uh, and, and our lives are built. Jesus is our rock and he said, I will build my church. And so it's important to understand that we are his church uh, called by his name, bought by, with his blood, filled with his spirit, and there is nothing the devil can do to stop us. Hell cannot and will not prevail against us, amen, because we are an unstoppable force. And so, again, I believe that all of hell trembles at the thought that we will one day discover who we are and what we are called to do. The book of Acts chapter 17 and verse 6 says, These men have come here who have turned the world upside down. And so again, you know that the church is, is meant to have an effect on its society. Acts 9 and verse 31, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. You see, the church was being built up by Jesus. You see, we don't have to build the church. We are the church. And we are being built by Jesus. We are being built up by him. Amen. Christ is building you up. He is building me up. Amen. We must simply walk in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So the Bible says as they walked in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So that's our job. Walk in the fear of the Lord and allow the comforter to do his work in us and through us. And we will see the growth that we desire because I believe God wants us to go from addition to multiplication because that's what happened the early church that's what's going to happen the end times church you know there have been so many others who have you know made declarations over the church you know that the church is finished and God's finished with the institutional church as they call it and you know God's doing a new thing etc etc you know as Nietzsche said God is dead but you know Nietzsche's dead and most likely in hell uh, but God is alive and and the church is alive because Jesus Jesus is building the church. Could somebody say amen? amen? We are the church and we are unstoppable. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. So hell cannot prevail against you. Amen. And when we understand this, we will not be discouraged by the setbacks or trials that invariably come our way. Because we know it's just a matter of time before we see our breakthrough. Turn to your neighbor and say, breakthrough's on the way, baby. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. When you know that, 
You will not be fearful or terrified um, by those uh, uh, like those who surround you right now. I know there's a lot of people very fearful right now. Well, you know, Pastor, the, the WEF and, and, and your Bill Gates wants us to eat worms and, and uh, you know, Klaus Schwab is, <laughs> I mean, that guy looks like he walked out of a Bond movie. You know, uh, I mean, all, all of these strange things that are happening right now in the world, I, I understand why people are fearful. I mean, you study history and you see, you know, the famines and the millions of people that have died, you know, historically, within the last 100 or 200 years, millions and millions of people have died of, of famine. And so, yes, in the natural, you look at, you know, these moves to eliminate meat and to, you know, cut back fertilizer as a consequence of this, you know, food output would be drastically reduced with the consequence that, you know, in the natural, there would be famines. And you have to ask yourself, you know, I mean, what kind of an idiotic person... Uh, would be running a government that would endorse or embrace many of these, um, uh, you know, policies. Um, and, and yet there is a blindness, there is a darkness that's coming on the world and many people are buying into it. I'm sorry, I don't buy into the whole climate change cult. Um, uh, I prefer to think for myself. Amen. And, uh, but anyway, you know, I was just reading last night my Bible, and you know, I just thought this is so encouraging. And uh, uh, because when you look at the big, uh, you know, the big picture of everything that's going on right now, there's a lot of really crazy and very disturbing things happening. You know, uh, whether locally or internationally, okay, and um, uh, you know, uh, in, in some ways unprecedented things. Um, uh, but when you look at what the Word of God says in Daniel two, um, you watch. Watched while a stone was cut without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. That's the symbolic. Uh, the iron and feet are the Antichrist kingdom. The Antichrist kingdom, which you know is 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 starting to be manifested ar around us in some ways, you could say, um, uh, and and that's why you you have leaders that are you know pursuing policies that are uh, you, you know patently illogical and uh, very much not in the interest of the people for whom they're meant to be governing. And so you have to ask yourself, why is that happening? Well, it's, it's, there's an antichrist agenda. However, as believers, we are not meant to be wasting all of our time watching YouTube videos, wondering where is the antichrist and what's he doing? That is not our focus. Our focus is on the stone that was cut because here we see it says that uh, the image was cut and it says it struck the image on its uh, feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor and the wind carried them away so that there was no trace of them was found. So, you know what? It doesn't matter who you mention. You know, WEF and, uh, you know, George Soros, Bill Gates, whoever, whatever agenda you want to talk about. You know, uh, the Bible says the time is going to come that there will not be a trace of these uh, individuals or entities or the agendas that they are pushing because they have no power power because our God reigns. Our God sits on the throne. Jesus Christ is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. And so I just want to say to you, child of God, do not be afraid. God is in control. Could somebody say thank you, Jesus? Amen. How many of you believe that? Our God is in control. That's really nothing to do with the message. I just thought some of you might need to hear that. Because a lot of believers getting very anxious and fearful. And you know what? We shouldn't be fearful. When you see all these things happening, what did Jesus say? Lift up your heads. Glory to God. Because your redemption draweth nigh. Glory to God. The time is coming close where Jesus Christ is going to split those clouds. He's going to come down. He's going to return in glory. Hallelujah. Our God reigns. Amen. Our God reigns. Amen. So, amen. Read the book and you won't be afraid. So, anyway, when you know this, that you are unstoppable, you know that God's purposes will prevail in your life and there is nothing the devil can do about it in Jesus' name. 2 Samuel 5.20 So David went to Belparazim and there he defeated the Philistines. He said, The Lord has broken through my enemies like a flood. And so that place is called Baal Parazim, which literally means God of breakthroughs. Hallelujah. How many of you are glad you serve a God of breakthroughs? How many of you today say, you know what, I need a breakthrough. 
Amen? Glory to God. I, I thank you. Uh, you know, I, I thank you, Lord, that you are the God of breakthroughs. And so, you know, if you need a breakthrough, he's a specialist. God is the God of breakthroughs. And while he never promised us a life without battles, he did promise us the victory in them. And I think it's important to understand that. Amen. He did promise us the victory in the battle. Amen. So the enemy may try to hinder. He may try to hold you back. But ultimately, he cannot stop you. Amen. Because he cannot stop God and you belong to him. Amen. Could somebody say, I belong to Jesus? Amen? So when you understand that, you recognize you are unstoppable. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Amen? So God is our refuge. He is our strength. And this is why we don't have to be afraid. Amen? And uh, I just want to read the, the, the second verse. Uh, <clears throat> God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. So have you, have you seen any mountains disappear lately? No? Uh, I mean, is the earth still under our feet? Yes. Well, you know, we've no reason to fear. But the Bible says even if that happens, you still don't have a reason to fear. Why? Because God is your refuge and he is your strength. And so let the winds blow. Let the storms come. Let the enemy rage. Because you know what? He is a defeated foe. Amen. You, you are a victory waiting to happen. Glory to God. It's just a matter of time. You are a winner. You are a champion. You are more than a conqueror through Christ who gives you strength. Amen. So you know what? Come what may, you cannot be shaken and you cannot be forsaken. Glory to God. You are a member of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Glory to God. Amen. We are members of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And so this is why it's important. We build our lives on him. Just like Jesus said to Peter, on this rock, is your life built on Jesus? Amen. Is your life built on him? Amen. So we must keep our eyes on Jesus Christ because the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 7. The Lord will cause your enemies who, uh, <clears throat> the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come against you one way and flee from you seven ways. Some of you sitting here today or maybe watching today are under assault right now. You know, depression, death, despair, addiction, family problems, anxiety, heartbreak, the list goes on and on. But just watch what God will do in your life. He has this, he hasn't forgotten you, and he will not forsake you. You see, too many times, we are, we, we are paralyzed at fear because of the voice of our giants. And we all have our giants. How, how many of you know, death has a voice? You're never going to clear me. You know, sickness has a voice. You're never going to get better. You know, addiction, you're never going to be free. Uh, dep depression, things are never going to change in your life. But you know what? It's so important that we don't give place to the devil, like the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 27. Don't listen to his lies. Like David, it's time to rise up by faith and take hold of your promise. Amen? You're, you, it's time to talk back because your giant needs to hear your voice in Jesus' name. Because David discovered that a man who faces his fears with faith wins every time. If you will face your fears with faith, you will win. It's just a matter of time because God's promise is greater than your problem. God's mercy is greater than your sin. Amen. And so this is why we become unstoppable firstly when we discover our righteousness. I touched on it last week when I spoke, but I want to deal with it more in detail because it's very important. Job 33 and verse 26, he restores to man his righteousness. What a glorious promise. What a glorious promise. For he restores to man his righteousness. And yet, sadly, many of us have never really taken time to consider what this actually means for us. I want us to look at Job chapter 25 and verse 4 to 6. How then can man be righteous before God? Or how can he be pure who is born of a woman? 
If even the moon does not shine and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much more man who is a maggot and the son of man who is a worm? And, you know, that has given birth to some kind of, you know, uh, maggot ideology or worm ideology. Oh, Lord, I'm nothing but a, worm, a miserable worm. You know, no, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about man and his sinful state. And, um, you, you know, without Christ, yes, uh, we are, uh, you know, just worms of the dust, so to speak. We're, we're nothing but a maggot. However, uh, man is a sinner, and, and here, this, this, this passage simply acknowledges reality that man is eternally separated by his sin from God. Isaiah 59 and 2 in the New Living, it is your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. The ESV, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. The Berean Bible, but your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And so this is the reality is unredeemed man is separated by God. There's a barrier between him and God, and that is sin. You see, Adam and Eve lost their righteousness in the fall, and along with it, their confidence before God, because righteousness is simply right standing with God. And this is why they became consciousness, conscious of their nakedness because in the beginning the Bible says they were naked and not afraid uh, they were not fearful Genesis 2 25 however when they sinned the Bible says that they hid from God they hid from their uh, from God's presence and it's interesting Adam the first thing Adam said uh, we saw we were naked and we were afraid and so fear came in as a consequence of sin. And that's why if you're a born again believer, you must not give fear any place in your life. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. And so if you have fear in your life right now, that is from the devil, and you need to command that thing to go in the name of Jesus. Amen? If you're struggling with thoughts in your mind, if you're having panic attacks, if you're struggling with paranoia, or, or your mind is, is, is jumping to all sorts of irrational conclusions, you need to take authority over that because that is not from God and that is not the way God wants you to live. You're called to be at peace in Jesus' name. Amen. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, so you need to resist that and command that to go in the name of Jesus. And listen, after COVID, I understand why many people are like that, but that's not the way God wants you to be. Why? Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And if he is enthroned in your heart, you're going to have peace in Jesus' name. Come on, you're going to be able to sleep at night. You're not going to be popping pills to go to sleep and popping pills to get going. Glory to God. I mean, that's not the way God wants us to live. So anyway, um, Adam and Eve sinned, and as a consequence of that, uh, you know, they were conscious of their, of their nakedness, and they hid um, from God in fear. And man has been hiding from God ever since behind titles, good works, you know, religion, etc. Because sin always makes man a coward. Because it's our sin consciousness that fills us with guilt, fear, inferiority, inadequacy, and causes us to be fearful before the enemy. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 16. Verse 15. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Um, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles you shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken. For dust you are. And to dust you shall return. And this is why since the fall... Mankind's history has been a long list of heartache, struggle, disappointment, and failure. Mankind is always striving uh, for something he can't achieve. You know, he's, he's always stretching for something he can't reach, looking for a place he can't find, you know, a connection he can't make, a desire he can't describe, much less meet. Because there's something on the inside of, 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 of man that, that isn't satisfied uh, by, by these things. And so, you know, people are always looking for something. They, they can't even explain uh, what they want or, or aspire to. Because deep down, they just know that whatever they have, it's not it. You know, they, they know that deep down, what they desire, they do not 
have. Fame, wealth, accomplishment, notoriety, power, influence, all of these things only serve to, to sharpen man's appetite and, and to remind him that he doesn't have what he so desperately desires and needs. You know, 30 years ago, I shared the gospel with a man on, in, in Cork. I was on a, a business course, and I got talking to him about the gospel. And he was much older than me. I was only a kid at the time. And uh, I remember him he, he, he saying to me, I have a wife that loves me. Um, you know, my kids, they've all gone through college, they've got good jobs, um, you know, everything is, is going well. He said, you know, I have money in the bank, um, you know, my, my house is, is paid for, um, I don't know, I don't owe anything. And then he looked at me and said with sadness in his eyes, I should be happier. But clearly, he wasn't. Because man does not understand that things doesn't, you know, can't satisfy him. Things do not make him happy. And, and yet so many times we're looking for happiness in all the wrong places. And so man longs for what he lost in the garden. Righteousness. That is what we lost. Because it's interesting, um, you know, it's a beautiful thing that marriage, it, it, man was allowed to bring marriage from the garden. Um, you know, we still have gold. The Bible acknowledged that there was gold there. We still have land. We still have animals. We still have food. Um, but you know, the one thing that man wasn't able to bring from the garden was righteousness because he was now a sinner separated from God. And so, again, the one thing he lost was righteousness. And, you know, Hebrews chapter 10 uh, it talks about, therefore having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You see, the blood of Jesus gives us access to the very place that mankind has been longing for for millennia. God's presence. Because the blood of bulls and goats could only cover your sin. It was like road tax. You pay for six months, six months time, you got to pay again. Amen. But you know what? The Bible says the blood of Jesus takes away our sin. And this is why it's so powerful. And if you can get that revelation that you are righteous, you are going to have a new boldness when you pray. You're going to have a new boldness in coming into God's presence. You're not going to be saying, oh God, please forgive me a poor miserable worm. You're going to come boldly say, thank you, Father. Here I am. I'm your child. Glory to God. I'm right. I'm right in your sight, not because I'm perfect, but because you are perfect. Glory to God. Having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So again, uh, it's righteousness that gives us access to the holy presence of God. Because remember, Jesus came to give us relationship, not religion. John 17 and verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you. What does God want from you more than anything else in the world? He just wants you to know him. He wants you to know him. Everything else that he will do through you will be out of that relationship. And if you don't have that relationship, it doesn't matter what title you're given, what position you have, it will accomplish nothing. It's going to be like chaff in eternity. Our relationship with God is so important. And so, again, um, uh, you know, righteousness gives us access to God's presence. So let not, uh, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And yet, the most common response I get when I'm on the street, uh, talking to people about salvation or eternal life, um, is this. People will say, well, I'm, I'm Catholic, I'm Protestant, I'm Buddhist, I'm Methodist, I'm Hindu, uh, you know, I'm atheist. And, um, uh, you know, people will list, um, uh, you know, what they are rather than who they are. They will, they will give, uh, what it is, it's, it's a label that enables them to evade the issue. I'm not talking about what, are you, what religion you are, what affiliation you have. I'm talking to you about eternity. Do you know God? Oh, well, I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other. And, and like I said, it's just a label of, a flag of convenience, really. It's a label that people hide behind um, to evade the issue. You see, Adam and Eve hid, and mankind, like I said, has been hiding from God ever since. You know, we just hide behind the facade of religion, or ritual, or education, or accomplishment. But you see, it is righteousness that gives us uh, access to the presence of God. And righteousness also gives us boldness in the face of Satan and the powers 
of darkness. Um, you know, I love that story of, of Smith Wigglesworth, the, the great British um, uh, preacher who, you know, back in the 90, early 1900s, he was in bed, asleep. He wakes up, he heard something in the room, uh, he lights a candle, and there sitting at the end of the bed is Satan. Uh, you know, not one of his minions, um, you know, uh, Satan himself. And uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth just goes, oh, it's just you. <sighs> Blows out his candle, goes back to sleep. That was a man who had a revelation of righteousness. He had a revelation the devil couldn't touch him. Because of his righteousness through Christ. You see, righteousness gives us boldness in the face of Satan and the powers of darkness. But in its absence, we won't have any courage or confidence before the devil's attacks, temptations, and trials. We'll be, you know, you know we'll be constantly going on, oh, oh, please, please pray for me. And I, I often ask for prayer, but you know what? There, there's a time to pray for yourself. There's a time to just rise up and, and take authority. We're going to deal that in a few weeks' time. But you know what? This, this explains why many uh, believers are defeated and discouraged. Why? They are made new, but they don't know it. They have been set free, but they still languish in, in prisons of, of, of fear, sin, shame, and self-pity. Because you see, righteousness isn't about what we can do, but rather it's about what Jesus has done. Um, John Calvin said this, We shall never be clothed with the righteousness of Christ, except we first know assuredly we have no righteousness of our own. So as long as you are trying to save yourself, you're not saved. And there's many Christians who are trying to save themselves. They're trying to be good enough for God to do something in their life. They're trying to be good enough for God to answer their prayers. And they're, they're, you know, they're, they're trying to perform. And uh, let me say this, the cure for self-righteousness is self-awareness. Because it's only when you become aware of how far, you've, far you fall short of God's glorious standard of holiness that we are enabled to appreciate more fully what God has done in restoring to us our righteousness. He restores to man his righteousness. You see, it's by grace, true faith. The blood of Jesus Christ declares that we are righteous. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. How have we been justified? You, you know, people say, well, what does justified mean? It's just as if I'd never sinned. Just simply like that. We're justified by his blood. Amen. So Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19. And it says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. How do we have peace with God? Because of the blood. Amen. The blood has purchased peace for you and for me. Because it's righteousness, not religion, that gives us access to God's presence, favor, and blessings. You see, you can light a thousand candles. It's not going to do anything for you. You can touch an idol's foot or kiss, you know, kiss the toe of whoever. You know, it's not going to do anything for you. We come by the blood. We come by faith. It's by faith we're made righteous with God. And so the religious spirit always seeks to control and dominate. It's never concerned about people's welfare or God's glory, but rather with simply selfishly maintaining power and control um, at any cost. You see, the Pharisees were a perfect example um, of this. On a number of occasions, they showed their true colors. Mark chapter 3, Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed the man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everybody. Then he turned to his critics and asked, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? But they wouldn't answer him. Didn't say they couldn't, it says they wouldn't. They were obstinate in their religion. 
Some people are so obstinate in their religion. It's only when they opened their eyes in hell that they discovered that everything they believed was a lie. There is no salvation without humility. We must humble ourselves before God. So many people cling to a title or, or a religion or a tradition they were brought up in and sadly end up in an eternal fire as a consequence. It says they wouldn't answer him. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. At once the Pharisees went out and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. They had witnessed a marvelous miracle of a man with a withered hand, you know, a, a, a hand that, that you know, was obviously much shorter than the other. Jesus speaks to it, it grows out. They had witnessed this mighty miracle before their very eyes and they couldn't deny it. But instead of giving God the glory, instead of praising God for what had just happened, it says they, they went out and sought to kill Jesus. I mean, talk about missing the, 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 the wood for the trees. Um, you know, they were blinded by, by religion to the reality that the Messiah was standing in front of them. The, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, again, uh, illustrates, you know, the religious spirit. And, um, and, and I don't believe that's, uh, you know, just uh, Judaism. Or, it, it, I believe this is something that transcends all, all faiths, all religions. Is this, uh, you know, inability at times to see the truth that's standing right in front of your face. Um, because you've been blinded by tradition. And um, verse 11 of Matthew, chapter 28, and it says... Now when they were going, behold, some of the guards came to the chief priests and, the th and told them the things that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, uh, Tell them, the disciples came at night and stole away his body while we slept. And uh, if it comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And that saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. I mean, think about the seriousness of what is happening here. These men know that Jesus has risen from the dead. But the religious spirit has so blinded them and hardened their heart that they want to cover it up rather than acknowledge the fact that this is the Messiah that we have prayed for and believed for and cried out for for thousands of years. I think that is so tragic. You know, even when Christ rose from the dead, they sought to suppress the truth in order to maintain control. Romans chapter 1, I don't have time to go through it, but it talks about that. It says, man, verse 18, who suppressed the truth. You know, journalism used to be about, you know, seeking the truth. But journalism died during COVID. It died during COVID. When so many uh, media organizations chose to take their 30 pieces of silver from the government and knowingly, you know, lie, knowingly, you know, push propaganda that has damaged people to the point where you still have people, even today, driving around in their car on their own with a mask on. It's your choice if you want to wear it out in public. I understand, that's, that's fine. But I mean, you're in your car. You can't give it to yourself. <laughs> Moving on. But to be honest, I've seen it over the years. I I've seen this thing over the years, even within the church. Men who shamelessly name drop, manipulate, and literally coerce in order to maintain control, power, influence, and even dominance over people at any cost. You know, literally anything, everything is on the table because it, for them, it's not about people, it is about power. And it doesn't please God. Ezekiel 34. Then the message came to me from the Lord, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds, the leaders of Israel. Give them this message from the sovereign Lord. What sorrow awaits you, shepherds, who feed yourselves instead of your flock. Shouldn't shepherds feed their sheep? You drink the milk, wear the wool, and butcher the best animals, but you let your flock starve. You have not taken care of the weak. You have not tended the sick. 
or bound up the injured. You've gone uh, looking, uh, you've not gone looking for those who have wandered away and are lost. Instead, you've ruled them with harshness and cruelty. So my sheep have been scattered without a shepherd and they're easy prey for any wild animal. As a pastor, let me say this, I don't say things or address issues because I want to offend or alienate or hurt anybody's feelings. But I understand this, I'm accountable to God and I have a responsibility to Him to simply proclaim the truth. Why you do what it is up to you, entirely up to you. But my responsibility is to declare it in Jesus' name. You know, cutting pieces off a, a child's body isn't progress. Castrating a child isn't progress. It's demonic. It's demonic and the church needs to speak up. A man is a man, a woman is a woman. Therefore you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord as surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord. You abandoned my flock and let them be attacked by every wild animal. And though you were my shepherds, you didn't search for my sheep when they were lost. You took care of yourselves and left the sheep to starve. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I now consider these, I now consider these shepherds my enemies. You know, the Bible talks about how you can be an enemy of the cross. That is a very sobering thing. To stand before the Lord in eternity and recognize that, that you know, uh, because of your obsession with being popular or inclusive or tolerant or, 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 or celebrated by the world, that you ended up becoming an enemy of the cross. Here he says that these shepherds are my enemies. If a man or a woman is telling you something that is not consistent with what the word of God says, they are an enemy. They are from the enemy and they are serving his purposes. I now consider these shepherds my enemies and I will hold them responsible for what has happened to my flock. I will take away their right to feed the flock and I will stop them from feeding themselves. You watch a man or a woman who is not serving God honestly, who is not walking in integrity. They might fool everybody else, they're not fooling God. And the time comes when God will deal with them and remove them from their position. And there's nothing that they can do. He says, I will rescue my flock from their mouths. The sheep will no longer be their prey. You see, we who pastor would do well to remember that they are God's sheep and that it is God's house. Amen? It's God's house, it is His church. And we are accountable to Him for how we lead. Matthew 5 and 20. But I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, the Pharisees were very religious, so if being religious could save you, they were sorted. But Jesus made it very clear that they were not. He said in John chapter 8 and verse 23, he, he, he warned them. He said that if you do not believe that I'm he, you will die in your sins. And he said to them, you are from beneath, I'm from above. You're of this world, I'm not of this world. Sorry, got the wrong verse there. Verse 23, verse 24. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I'm he, you will die in your sins. Jesus told them that notwithstanding their religion and their ritual and their grace, knowledge and their study and their sacrifice, that they would die in their sins if they didn't repent and believe in him. Acts 4 and verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which they may be saved. And so again, we must understand, salvation is through Jesus alone. Uh, the great American revivalist Jonathan Edwards all men are naturally full of sin and there are no saviors of sinners no way of salvation but by Christ you see religion doesn't save Jesus does 
Romans 1.17 For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith because the righteousness of man and the righteousness of God are two very different things. The righteousness of man is based on ritual and sacrifice and effort while the righteousness of God is based on faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. I mean, because again, you know, the vast majority of religions in the world, they're all based on the very same premise that you have to try to work to save yourself. Christianity is different in that it presents us, you know, this offer of salvation by simply trusting in Christ because it was he who did the work, not us. We just gratefully receive it. How many of you glad today say, I'm saved. Jesus is my Lord. Heaven is my home. The devil's power is broken over me. Glory to God. Those chains have been broken. He gets the glory. Martin Luther, Christ took our sins and the sins of the whole world as well as the Father's wrath on his shoulders and he has drowned them both in himself so that we are thereby reconciled to God and become completely righteous. Jesus took it on his shoulders he took my sin, he took your sin, so that you could be forgiven and so that you could be free. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. What is your hope built on? Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for their self-righteousness. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 27 and 28. <coughs> Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Verse 32. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt, serpents, Brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? People talk about, well, the God I serve doesn't judge. Well, that's not the God of the Bible. Jesus is coming back as a judge. Right now, you have the offer of grace, but that is a time-sensitive offer, and the time will come when that offer is withdrawn because Christ will be returning as the judge, and there's such a thing as too late with regards to eternity. And this is why as the church, we must awaken to the hour that we're in. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, not because he hated them, but because he loved them. He loved them. And he loved them enough to speak the truth to them. This was his mercy because he wanted them to hear. But Leonard Ravenhill said this, the self-righteous never apologize, and neither do they hear. Those who are self-righteous do not hear, they do not listen. And so the Pharisees willfully rejected the truth, and these men have had the last 2,000 years to regret their decision to trust in their own self-righteousness. Charles Spurgeon, the greatest enemy to human souls is the self-righteous spirit which makes men look to themselves for salvation. Are you looking to yourself for salvation? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I think that kid was speaking for some people in the congregation. <laughs> No, we don't trust in ourselves because we can't save ourselves. <laughs> Dwight L. Moody said this, God has nothing to say to the self-righteous. I want to ask you today, has the voice of God been silent in your life? Has it been silent in your life lately? It may be an indication that pride is the problem that you need to humble yourself, and that you need to stop trying to work to save yourself. By grace we've been saved through faith. This is not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
It's by God's grace, and we must never forget what God's grace has accomplished through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. Oh, well, Pastor, I've heard all this before. That's the problem. We have lost our sense of reverence. We've lost our sense of appreciation for what Christ accomplished on the cross. But for Jesus, we would be lost. And this is why Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. He rebuked them because he loved them. Luke 18 and verse 11, the Pharisees stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not like as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. The Bible says he prayed with himself. He prayed, but God wasn't even listening because he was praying with himself. Because you know, we cannot please God or attain righteousness by our own efforts. You know, Romans 8 and verse 8 says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It's impossible. And so again, if you are full of pride or arrogance or you're looking down your, your nose at other people, you know, again, I address issues in, in my messages, not because I, I, I despise people or you know, want to disrespect them, but because I know there is such a thing as objective truth. And when our Tornish is talking about how he feels there should be a, a third gender, um, you know, on, on, on census, I mean, th this is idiotic, particularly for somebody who has a medical background. It's idiotic, but it's an indication of how deluded our generation has become. And so Jesus spoke truth because he loved. And so we must humble ourselves before the Lord, amen? Because again, there is no salvation outside of cross, Christ. There is no salvation outside of the cross. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed through lack of of knowledge. You see, Satan takes advantage of believers who don't know their right standing with God. And as long as you base it on your feelings or your emotions or your performance, you will always come up short. You'll never be sure that God loves you and, uh, or that he will answer your prayers. And you'll always be looking for somebody else to pray the prayer of faith. The Bible says the prayer of faith will save the sick. Any one of you can pray the prayer of faith. Any one of you can lay hands on the sick. Any one of you can cast out devils. Any one of you can lead somebody to Jesus. You need to just understand that you are righteous and that God will use you. Yes, you may have some struggles. Yes, you may have some failures, but thank God for the blood. Thank God that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. As the worship group come forward, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are right righteous, not because you are perfect, but because Jesus Christ was perfect. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. I really only got through the introduction today, but we'll deal with the other half next week. But this is such an important subject, and, and I see so many believers who struggle because they're just so full of shame and condemnation. But you know, the Bible says there's now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, at times we stumble, at times we fall, at times we fail, but thank God for the blood that speaks over us and declares that we are righteous, that declares that we are forgiven, and that declares that we are free. <laughs>